God in heaven, rest your hand on my weary soul. I cannot do this. <clears throat> Welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be discussing yet another terrible book that I've read. I hope you're excited. I know I am. Today we are discussing The Never King by Nikki St. Crow. I did touch on this book in the last video that I made, and if you haven't watched that already and you aren't really into spoilers, that might be a better place to start. This one, we're getting into it. And the 159 annotations that I made. There's only one disclaimer, but let's go ahead and get it out of the way. This review will contain opinions, spoilers, and general shit talking. If you don't want to hear me talk badly about this book, if you plan to read this book and don't want it spoiled, or if you don't know how to behave when a person on the internet that you don't know has opinions that don't directly line up with yours, this review is not for you. It's also not for the author. Just, just throwing that out there. <sighs> Let's get into the details. The Never King is a dark white shoes romance and span mm, spicy fairy tale retelling, reimagining, including the Lost Boys and Peter Pan. Yeah, it was first published in February, 2022. It has 192 pages and it is book one of four in the completed Vicious Lost Boys series. <sighs> this book has multiple POVs. I think there's five in total. And even though it's probably standard for something like this, cause you got a lot of people in the mix. I didn't care for it in this book. We'll get to it. Synopsis reads, the stories were all wrong. Hook was never the villain. For two centuries, all the darling women have disappeared on their 18th birthday. Sometimes they're gone for only a day, some week or a month, but they always return broken. Now on the afternoon of my 18th birthday, my mother is running around the house making sure all the windows are barred and the doors are locked. But it's pointless because when night falls, he comes for me. And this time the Never King and the Lost Boys aren't willing to let me go. I'm not going to lie to you because we're buds. I was excited to read this. When I was a kid, my grandparents used to take me to the video store and I went through like a series of weeks where I only wanted to rent the cartoon Disney version of Peter Pan. So the idea of a darker, spicy reimagining of this story really appealed to me. And I liked the idea that the darling women are cursed to repeat the same fate over and over again. And I wanted to explore that. I was very excited. I even added it to my dark romance spreadsheet. Link below. And this isn't the first Peter Pan reimagining that I've read, actually. I read Hooked by Emily McIntyre, and I had fun with it. I liked the little Easter eggs, so that had me feeling hopeful for this one. Womp womp. <clears throat> the trigger warnings, according to the author's website, mental illness, smoking, graphic rough sex, sex in public, group sex, dub con, graphic violence, graphic language, captive captivity, degradation, submission, bondage, ropes, spanking, blood play, choking, CNC, talk of sexual assault. I do always appreciate when an author gives a list of the trigger warnings, so this is the space I'm holding to praise her for that. I'd also sprinkle in, I don't really even know how to explain this, odd depiction of a sex worker or sex work in general. I, I don't know, but we're going to get into it when we get there, but just know something strange is afoot. The word is thrown around a lot too with reckless abandon. Raise your hand if you're excited about it. No one. So I think the scene has been set. Has it? I don't know, but let's go. Chapter one, Winnie. So our first chapter and first POV belongs to our female main character, Winnie Darling. Not Wendy, okay, Winnie, like the bear. Oh, bother. She's the latest almost 18 year old in the Darling line. We find her on the day before her 18th birthday. I love her like instantly. I haven't attended a normal high school in over two years. Yet I find myself hooking up with a star quarterback in the passenger seat of his SUV. This is page one, children having sex. <laughs> He's bad at sex, magnificent on the football field. If only I liked football and hated sex. Anthony shoves inside me and I make the star face for him because I know he likes it. I pretend to orgasm with him. I'm not a star, but I am the daughter of a So I think that's close enough. Oh, fuck yeah, Winnie, fuck, oh, baby. That was bad, I'm sorry. Oh, fuck yeah, Winnie, fuck, oh, baby. I don't know, I don't know where that, I don't know where that voice came from. His grip on me is loose and clammy. He's trembling like the boy he is. We're the same age, but decades apart. He says and breathes hot air against my naked chest. 
That was so good. Was that good? The lack of confidence is insufferable. I don't know that I've ever slept with a confident man. Well, you're 17. I'd hope not. Or maybe that's wrong. Maybe they're only confident in the taking. So good, baby. You're so good at sex. And I'm so good at lying. Are you? Ooh, rocky start. Who talks like this? This is our first look at Winnie and man. We're blessed. She's not in high school, as she said, but high schoolers are in her. Weird. Also, daughter of a... I don't know if that's true, but maybe I just misremembered something. We'll find out, I guess. Nothing about Winnie screams girl boss empowered by her own sexuality to me, though I do think that that's the goal. She just seems like a neglected, unwell teenager who is expressing this through promiscuity. Maybe I'm just old and bitter. Or, or maybe the neglected, unwell, promiscuous teen in me recognizes the unwell, neglected, promiscuous teen in her. I digress. She goes on to tell us how she's dead inside and bored and hates everything. The only thing I have to look forward to is being kidnapped by a meth. So she is aware that this is about to happen to her, but she doesn't really believe it because she thinks her mom is cuckoo bananas and her mom has been hospitalized several times moves them around a lot it's a very chaotic lifestyle that she's living they threw schizophrenia in here as a, a possible diagnosis for the mother which we love great Winnie is more concerned about going crazy like her mom as opposed to being kidnapped because she doesn't really think that that's true anyway she comes home and sits with her mom her mom's name is mary like merry christmas in a barricaded room and they chit chat about the island and shocking to everyone I'm sure. Mary actually is an off her rocker. She was telling the truth the whole time. And Pan shows up and yoinks her off to Neverland. Mm. Chapter two. POV. Peter Pan. It takes me twice as long to get back to Neverland in the treehouse with a darling thrown over my shoulder. She's light as a feather. Her rib bones are sharp enough to hurt. This darling is not well. Perhaps her spider web cracks means she'll be easier to break open. Y'all come quick. The subjects and verbs are disagreeing again. <laughs> I'm just gonna read it again. Perhaps her spider web cracks means she'll be easier to break open. Okay, so real quick, spider web is a descriptive noun or an adjective. I'm not real sure, I don't. Anyway, the subject, which is plural, is the word cracks. It's cracks. Say crack again. Crack. So since the subject is plural, the verb needs to correlate, right? The cracks means she will be easier to break is not correct. It's not correct. But I can't stay here. I can't stay here because my blood pressure. My blood pressure are high. I means it. So he takes her to the Never Tree, which is dying because something is up with the magic and the island. I don't know. We are met by three of the many Lost Boys. The first two being a set of twins named Cass and Bash. And a violent, ominous one named Vane. Can't really tell the twins apart ever except one likes to cook. I don't know, who cares? The twins follow Pan as he takes Winnie to her brand new bedroom and chains her to the bed. Cool, Pan leaves them with her. Watch her, I order as I get up and make my way for the door. But don't touch. We know the rules, Bash said, a little annoyed to be told what to do. But Bash has always loved pretty things and this darling is prettier than the rest. Don't fuck the darlings, I say, just to be sure he hears me. It's the only rule we have. We don't fuck the darlings because fucking darlings is what got us into this mess in the first place. We don't fuck the darlings. We just break them. Okay, sport. If you don't fuck the darlings, but darlings is what got you into this mess in the first place. It seems like you do the darlings. Whatever. Chapter three, Winnie again. She opens her eyes and there's a boy staring down at her. Boy? Whatever. It's Cass. No, not a boy exactly. He has the youth of a boy with the presence of a man. Long black hair is tied into a bun at the back of his head. His gaze is knife-like, sharp and glinting as he takes in the sight of me. His skin is the color of a bright side of a blood moon and black tattoos run over his bare chest. All of the lines are precise and symmetrical on both sides of his body. They start at his neck and travel like a labyrinth over the rest of him, disappearing beneath the waistband of ripped black jeans. He's a vision of dark virility. Good morning, darling, he says. Where am I? I lurch upright to find I'm chained to a wall. That's kinky. So for her 18th birthday, this extremely unwell girl was gifted by being kidnapped by an urban legend fairy tale myth man and chained to a bed. But yeah, kinky. Kinky. Hot. There's something about these boys that's more potent than any of the boys I've hung out with before, and I've hung out with plenty. 
Yeah, we know. Pretty boys always make the time go by faster. I hate being bored, but most of all, I hate being alone. She takes in her surroundings, has a glass of water, and then tells us information that we did not ask about. I went to school with twins once back when mom and I lived in Minnesota. The wavy twins, the most obnoxious, annoying little girls I'd ever met. They used the fact that they were identical to get away with everything, including putting worms in my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> I wonder if these boys are the same. They look like trouble. They feel like the wrong kind of temptation, like a pretty tree frog that can kill you with a touch. I think everyone has a superpower, something they're just inherently good at. And mine has always been reading people, knowing what sort of person someone is before they speak a word. My note here was, I expect this to fall apart. It's giving Manic Pixie Nightmare Girl with a superpower that she doesn't actually have. Maybe once in her life, she saw someone and was like, I bet he likes to bone. And then they boned. Superpower. Mm. But also, why all of this just to say that the boys look like trouble? They look like trouble. That's four words right there. Right to the point. This is terrible writing. She and the twins exchange some more words and she's horny because of course she is. I've been alone in dark rooms with plenty of men, but none like the twins. They could easily take me in any way they wanted. Fighting them would be like fighting the ocean. <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> fighting them would be like fighting the ocean. Pointless, futile. But why would I? They look like they'd be a wild ride. I lick my lips and bash his nostrils flare as his attention wanders to my mouth. When you grow up around you learn a thing or two about tricks. She just licked her lips. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't have any chapstick. You know what? I understand. I understand. Cause I just got this and I'm obsessed with it. So. <laughs> okay. The twins tell her that they're the nice ones and there's actually someone even more scary than Peter Pan. And that's when we meet Bane. Who is meaner than Pan? My mom never said anything about there being others. I never thought to ask. When he darkens the doorway, the air gets lodged in my throat. This one isn't as muscular as the twins, but there's something more distinctly sinister about him. The scar, the eyes, Three long jagged scars cut his face in half diagonally from one temple to his jaw. It's changed his gaze. One eye is bright violet, the other pure black. Zane, is that you? Goosebumps lift off my arm despite the warm air. The darling is awake, the newcomer says in a cold, detached tone of voice. He comes over to Bash and steals the last of his cigarette, pinching it between his thumb and forefinger and takes a hit of a cigarette. Why is he holding a cigarette like it's the weed? Let's just hot you but when he speaks, he hasn't exhaled yet, so his voice is stilted as he holds the smoke in his lungs. She started crying yet. <laughs> Cass frowns. Something tells me this one will be harder to break. They all break eventually, the mean one says, eyeing me with his unsettling eyes. I automatically look away, my body singing with a creeping sense of dread. I draw back and try to make myself smaller. Mom said there was magic here. What kind of magic is this? I don't shrink. Not usually. Arguably, her shrinking back in the presence of a strange, scary man that she doesn't know is the most normal reaction she's had so far. Remember, she thought being chained to the bed was kinky. But Winnie's not normal, okay? There's something different about Winnie. Winnie likes the sex. Winnie's special. He tells her, don't run cause I'll catch you. And then he has some mind controlling thing that he uses on her and makes her like freak out. She has a panic attack and starts crying and he's like, told you and leaves. The twins offer to make her some food, telling her they won't bite. Not yet anyway. But the rule fellas, the rule. Chapter four, bash. Bash gives us a little bit more insight into their characters, which helps exactly not at all. Cass will pretend he's not like the rest of them. Vane will terrorize her and Bash, well, Bash will calm her down with food. Cloudberry pancakes to be exact. Of all the things in this dumbass book, the cloudberries and the cloudberry pancakes, I was, I, I was in it. I was in for that. I was like, drop the recipe. But no, um, they didn't. So they all crowd around her as she eats, except for Pan, because who knows where the hell he is. The twins exchange a look and they have some sort of like ability to communicate with each other through their thoughts. Other people around while they're doing this hear like tinkling bells, which uh, is something else that I thought was kind of cool, but blah, blah. the thought that they share, something's different about this one but they have rules. Pan has always had one rule about the darlings. They're off limits. We have plenty on the island to keep us busy without fucking around with a darling. We're the lost boys. And there's plenty of lost pussy to be found. I quit the video. I quit. Uh, I can't quit. We got so much more to do. They all stand around and watch her have an orgasm over these pancakes. Something's different about these darlings. She's basically blowing that pancake. <laughs>
in their weird twin telepathy, Bash asks Cass, Bash asks Cass, God, say that three times fast, what Darling smells like. And he replies, like secrets and forbidden fruit. <laughs> Thank you, that told me nothing. Both of Vane's eyes go black which is never a good sign, apparently. Something to do with his shadow of death and how horny he is for this teenager eating pancakes. They continue to marvel at the sight of her eating pancakes when a new character emerges named Cherry, a girl who was a pirate and now isn't, and all the boys hate her, but sleep with her, but hate her. Which I don't get if there's so much lost pussy to be found. Like, why are we having sex with people we don't like? But it doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to make sense. They say more mean things about Cherry, but she made her choices and I wish I could elaborate, but I can't. They tell Winnie to finish eating because Pan will wake soon. Chapter five. Winnie. So Cherry sticks around for a little bit and asks for some pancakes and they tell her no because they hate her. But Winnie is super smart and she's like, I can tell that this girl's desperate. So I'm going to befriend her. So she offers to share her pancakes with her. You can have some of mine. I slide my plate towards her. Really? She looks like she doesn't believe me. Of course. I don't need them all. I beg to differ, Bash says. There's a hardness to his face now. You're just skin and bones. Oh my God, she's teeny tiny. Love it. Now, the highlighted part here is a fragment shit show. At least a good story, right? Right? And the characters are likable, right? This chapter's short and it's basically just doing the whole breakfast scene from Winnie's POV and her prodding Terry when the boys leave. She also starts to feel a little guilty about not believing her mom all these years. Chapter six, Pan, ha <laughs> ha! We get some insight into Pan and his predicament. I have flesh and bones, but still no fucking shadow. How much longer do I have? So he's lost his shadow and because of this, he's dying, I suppose. When the sun can kill you and pirates are hunting you and your magic is fucking waning, all you have left are blades. Rock on, man, hardcore, HXC. The sun can kill you? Is this like a vampire? Thing, you know how I feel about vampires. They make everything better, sadly. I don't think this is vampires. Vane comes into Pan's cave tomb, leans against the dresser looking, quote, like he was carved from war. They discuss Cherry and how much they hate her, but she's loyal and they need to keep her loyal. And so that's Vane's job. She slept with all three of these main guys, but she really likes Vane the most. So he's tasked with doing her to keep her loyal. Nice. They enter the treehouse and Pan says, I can't see the darling yet, but I can feel her. We're a house of cold, hard edges. She's already made it feel warmer and I've barely known soft or warm in my life. He spent like eight minutes with her and then went to bed. But yeah, totally. I understand what's being attempted here, right? But I'm sure you understand it too, because we're smart smarts. However, it's not going well. I don't feel well. <laughs> it's a very neglected, promiscuous teenager. And that is all we know about her so far. Spoiler alert. There's nothing else. So where is the warmth coming from? From her put, you know what? Let's just move on. Take a swig and let the alcohol roll around on my tongue before swallowing it back, letting the burn settle in. It reminds me that I'm alive, aren't I? I snap my fingers at Bash and he brings me the steel cigarette case, flips it open for me so I can pluck one out, pull the lighter from my pants pocket, flick the wheel and light the end of the cigarette. Why did you walk me through that like a child at a zoo? Just say he got a cigarette. The smoke burns differently than the liquor, but it burns just the same. I'm alive. I am alive. I'm alive. <laughs> oh, he's cool. You can tell from the steel ciggy case and the alcoholism. Swoop. Pan and Vane take Millie. What? <laughs> Pan and Vane take Winnie to the beach and tell her this is Neverland. There's no escape. They also never miss an opportunity to tell us how rail thin she is. Teeny tiny itty bitty. She's not thin. She's malnourished and neglected, but okay. Let's keep talking about it. Winnie asks a few questions. Vane gets irritated. His eyes start to go black again. And Pan's like, OMG, you didn't tell me it was this bad. Winnie runs off even after Vane specifically told her not to. Vane is told to go walk it off and Pan goes after her. Chapter seven, Winnie again. We start this chapter with Winnie running and crying, except, oh my God, I don't cry. I don't cry. And maybe I'm just in a mood today, but you've been kidnapped, you know? Kidnapped by a mythical child man fae demon. I think it's cool if you cry a little bit. I would, I'm crying right now. After all the threatening, the terrorizing, the don't run or I'll chase you, Pan catches her and does nothing. 
For a split second, Pan softens. I can sense it in the fading of the tension in his body. That was vain, he says. He has the ability to make people feel terror. He? What? If it's any consolation, he didn't mean it. It's not. They go back and forth for a few seconds and it's as fun as it sounds. You kidnapped me. When do I get to go home? Do you always ask so many questions? And he tells her that if she ends up broken, it's her own fault. Because the harder she resists, the worse it'll be. It? I don't know what it is. And neither does she. And he's not about to elaborate. So he just tosses her over his shoulder and takes her back to the treehouse. And I want you to remember, this is one of the few times that we see her crying and afraid. She's scared. She doesn't want to be here. Inside, I'm tossed unceremoniously on the couch with my skirt bunched up around my waist. The twins notice. I take my time fixing it. Good, good. Can't miss an opportunity to shake that ass for some lost boys, huh? Yeah. She tells us more about the house, even though I didn't ask, did you? Also, I feel like that could have been done sooner. Setting is very important. Pan grabs some liquor and sits down to have a smoke. Once again, holding it like this. <laughs> I pretended to smoke for three years while I was in college for the vibes. You know, wasn't willing to damage my lungs for said vibes, but I wanted the vibes. I wanted to be the cool artsy girl smoking on the quad in between classes. And it all worked out because I got to look cool and I could still take deep breaths in cold weather, unscathed. Anyway, even a pretender like me knows you don't hold cigarettes like this. No, do it right. You're messing up the vibes. So Pan basically starts telling Winnie a little bit about what's gonna break her, how he plans to root through her mind for information that she may or may not have. And the more she resists it, the more broken she will be. But Winnie is distracted. Would you believe it by how hot he is? And she tells us about it. Thank you, God. Oh, there is a God. When I look at him, my belly soars. There's something about him that's disarming, a natural haunting, like a barren tree growing in the middle of a dark lake. Something that very rarely should be, and yet is. Scooch in for a nice game of why would you word it like that? Fun fact, here we go. Barren tree growing in the middle of a lake. Something that very rarely should be, okay? <clears throat> you mean like this? This is a cypress tree. It's not barren because this was shot in uh, the summer. But there are a lot of lone cypress trees growing out of the middle of dark lakes. So that would mean this analogy doesn't hold water, unlike this tree. It isn't something that very rarely should be, but instead it's something that very often is. Ah! Anywho, the twins escort her back to her room and chain her back up to the bed. It's an odd feeling suddenly being held captive in a house full of boys. A year ago, I'd call this a party. A few days ago, you would have called this a party. Okay, shut the f up. They say good night and that she did really good for her first day. She's like, LOL, I'm chained to a bed. I didn't have much choice. And then one of the twins, God only knows which one. We always have a choice. When? Quickly. Quickly tell me when. I definitely think that this is one of those times where the stoic, broody guy is supposed to drop a one-liner and hint at a deeper well of humanity residing inside of him. But it... I ain't working. <laughs> Chapter eight, Winnie again. I spent the summer of my 13th year living with mom in a rundown house that was crammed between two warring neighbors. One, a prude. The other, a... <sighs> Okay, so her mother isn't the sex worker. There's just her mother and the sex worker lived next door when she was 13. The prude neighbor's name is Beth Ann and the sworker's name is Starla. And Starla, quote, was rich and her body her currency. She knew better than mom how to use it. So maybe her mom is also a sworker? But then why did we need to write in another one? <clears throat> Winnie like idolizes Starla for her confidence or some shit and starts to creepily watch her every move. Winnie is weird. How did she do it? How did she exist in her skin and love being there? I studied her that entire summer, tried to learn her secrets. I'd always loved watching people. I found they were much easier to read when they didn't realize they were being watched. That's really concerning strange behavior, Winnie. But I mean, she's not really being parented, so. Well, it doesn't even sound like she was slinking around watching Starla, unbeknownst to Starla. It sounds like they were just hanging out. One afternoon, she somehow talked a man, a stranger, into buying us lunch. At the end of the summer, she pulled into her driveway in a brand new SUV that some guy bought her off the lot. Is he your boyfriend, I asked. She laughed. A baby girl. I don't do boyfriends. Men are my toys and I play with them regularly. I wanted her to be my mother. So this is weird, right? First of all, this is a very stereotypical rendition of what a sex worker is. Like conniving, manipulative, gold diggers that only want what they can 
can get from men. And I still don't understand where this is going. That was the note that I made in one of these spots. Like, where is this going? Why are we doing this? It does make sense though that she would feel closer to Starla because like I said, she seems to be spending a lot of time with Starla. But what? Flashback to reality. She's waking up on day two in Neverland. As I lay chained to a bed in a place I don't recognize, I can't help but ask myself, what would Starla do? WWSD. My note said, oh good, it went nowhere. So she decides to come up with a plan because that's what Starla would do. I'd never been a prude, not like Beth Ann. I didn't have the luxury of it. Uh, is being a prude a luxury? <sighs> now I'm about to venture slightly off course. We'll come back, okay? This whole storyline irked me to my very core. I think I understand what the author was attempting to do here. It was not handled well and just ended up making me uncomfortable. This is all very Madonna whore complexy. It's a psychological term coined by Sigmund Freud, the daddy of mommy issues. Basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the idea is that there are some women that you have fun with and some women that you commit to, that you take seriously. But the Madonna whore complex ultimately leaves no room for the idea that women are whole, well-rounded individuals that are capable of being many things at once. We see this a lot in media and our society as well, but the first one that popped into my noggin was Legally Blonde. My son has actually watched it like three times in the last few days, so that's probably why I thought of it first. Our main girl, Elle Woods, is outgoing and bubbly, and she's in a long-term relationship with her boyfriend, Warner. On the night that she thinks he's going to propose to her, he ends up breaking up with her because he, quote, needs to marry a Jackie not a Marilyn, which is another real life example of this complex in action. Warner then begins dating and gets engaged to a much more demure and respectable woman named Vivian Kensington. And since she's so much more refined and palatable as a human being, he sees her as a more respectable choice for a life partner than he ever did Elle, even though they were together for several years. But the difference in Legally Blonde, the Madonna Horror Complex is used as a plot device to fuel the story forward. It drives both the plot and the character development. The unnecessary Madonna whore complex in The Never King serves no purpose. And it almost feels like a try-hard inverted idea of the Madonna whore complex. Like, I'm gonna make the whore the hero. But she did it so poorly. Plus, she just ended up doing a really tacky, stereotypical rendition of what a sex worker looks like. It's still placing very strict parameters around these women, inverted or not, which is a shame because it seems like Starla was spending the most time with this kid out of anybody. And if the author had cooked this bullshit just a little bit longer, she may have realized and been able to explore how Starla pretty much broke the Madonna whore complex mold, as all women do. And what about Beth Ann? Okay, the prude? Maybe outwardly she's that, but Beth Ann might also be a secret member of a BDSM club held in a warehouse off I-95. We don't know anything about these women. That's why the Madonna Whore Complex doesn't work. But the author decided that we needed it in this book, and by keeping these characters ankle deep and further perpetuating stereotypes, the only goal the author seemed to achieve was serving a half-baked plot point that serves no purpose except to piss me off. So bravo, I guess. I can't stay here. Let's get back on track. It was why I went through half the basketball team freshman year of high school. They all gave me things I wanted and needed. Sometimes a ride to school, sometimes food. Other times it was just the sensation of being in my own skin. That was the year I got the nickname Winnie Whore. Hello darkness, my old friend. I didn't care then. I still don't care now. Winnie the Whore, huh? It's like Winnie the Pooh, except for instead of a jar of honey, it's a jar of cream. Oh, bother. I don't care and I still don't. Why are we talking about it then? Seems like you care. Again, this is just weird. Freshman year? She would've been like 13, 14. Coupled with the fact that she's deeply neglected and not doing great, she sees Starla and the way she behaves. So she thinks it's a good idea to start banging the basketball team, which shows you just how little her mind has yet to develop. That's not, a, those lines shouldn't have connected, but they did because she's a impressionable child looking for love in all the wrong places. Like, I know kids have sex. Like, I, I get it. I, I went to high school in the early aughts and I was also unwell, looking for love in all the wrong places. But I definitely don't look back on some of my lower moments and think like, yes, girl, slay. <laughs> it's more like, yo, girl, you okay? No, the answer was no. <laughs> Any hoosers, Winnie Whore tells us more about Starla. Most men don't realize this, she said once, but us girls, we have toolboxes too. Cars aren't stuffed with hammers and wrenches and screwdrivers. We have these and this. And there's no greater power than this. And brains, baby girl. Okay, three things. One, I have a toolbox with hammers and screwdrivers. It's pink and I use it often. How do you think these things got hung up? 
Two, when I was 13, I had no boobs, not even a whisper of a boob. So what good would this advice be? There would be nothing there. Three, I don't have a daughter, but I do have two sons. I cannot imagine one day walking up to them and be like, don't worry, buddy, you're gonna rule the world one day with your brain and your, hello? Okay. Never mind the fact that this isn't even her kid. If I heard someone else say this to my kid, I would rent a dune buggy and run them over in the street. Dune buggy won't kill them, you know, but it'll send a message. All of this just to build up to the point of Winnie hatching an ingenious plan. I'm gonna fuck a lost boy. She really used every ounce of brain and boob on this plan there, didn't she? Ah, I'm so glad we took that long walk down shit avenue to end up with such rewarding results. Seriously, like I wasn't even raised by a sworker and I could have figured this out on my own. Christ, is this supposed to be a revelation? She's been banging her way through her adolescence this whole time. It's one of her only characteristics. She's Winnie the whore for crying out loud. Oh, bother. Chapter nine, Cass. If the darling calls for me, I come. She's been there for a full 24 hours, Cass, okay? Give me a break. Cass goes to comfort her. Naturally, she chooses him as the target of her ingenious plan to fuck her way to freedom. <laughs> he evades her advances though. And instead he just lays with her and projects night sky onto the ceiling and says, quote, some darlings like magic, some don't. Sensational. He reminds us that Pan has lost his shadow and that the darling might be able to help him get it back and save the island. Blah, no one cares. And least of all, Winnie, way too busy being wowed by the magical sky display. In your world, I tell her, I believe you might've called us fairies. She laughs and that glimmering starlight plays across the line of her brow. But I don't believe in- Don't say it. She frowns. Promise me you won't. She gives a quick nod, so I pull my hand away. Why not, she asks. You can't say you don't believe in, darling. If you say it, I'm dead. I would scream it, rip. They keep chatting. She asks him why he doesn't have wings if he's a fairy. He says they were taken. So good. Eventually, Wendy does try out a move, touching his tattooed chest. I snatch her wrist. Don't. Don't what? I know what you're doing. And what's that? You're trying to cause tension in the group. You're not the first to think you're smarter than us. You're not, darling. Whatever strategy you think you're plotting, we've seen it before. We've watched every move play out and all the darlings bend eventually. I want to fuck her just to teach her a lesson. <sighs> See, though, even Cass is like, all your relatives have already tried this. And what are the chances that each of them had their own Starla? This was not why... <sighs> he rebuffs her, even though he's rock hard, and storms off to the bonfire party on the beach, passing his brother on the way out. The rest of the Lost Boys are sitting around the bonfire, and there's a dozen girls from town. They're always desperate for the attention of the king and his men. I pick one out. Any will do. You, I tell a girl with dark brown hair. Get on your knees. Her eyes go wide, and she looks past me to the others. On your knees, or leave. You choose. Oh my god. Angel. He goes on to use words like, brutally and mercilessly to describe what he's doing to this girl in front of everybody. So cute. He's also imagining that it's Winnie the whole time, which just makes everything so much more precious. Like twirl the hair, kick the feet. Chapter 10, Winnie again. The chain that cuffed me to is just long enough for me to leave bed and reach the bank of the windows. Shutters are still open so I can hear everything going on down there. I hear Cass tell a girl to get on her knees and she does it without question. The rest of them hanging out by the fire watch as he takes her. Some weird foreign feeling fills my chest as I watch. I'm buzzing between my legs suddenly what i was gonna do that that should be me except watching him why the hell am i so aroused by this you've been aroused since you landed okay bash burst into the room what did you do to my brother rar all you darlings are trouble <sighs> he slams her into a wall and in his rage reveals to her that pan is dying and they pause awkwardly for a little bit and when he works out that she chose the wrong twin as her first conquest starla i think I'll make you proud. You fuck the one that's good and ready, she'd say. Man, this is weird. This is an 18 year old kid, remember? She just turned 18. She quote, channels her inner Starla and grabs him. <laughs> He's like, screw it, let's go. And then shoves off or in. Just a quick question though. Like how many of these darlings and their potential offspring belong to the, I swear if this is incest, cannot keep coming for me like this. I can't do it anymore. I, ah! Pan shows up and they freeze. Remember their rule. Don't stop on my account. He comes into the room sitting in the wingback chair behind me. Bash exhales, almost a sigh. He's still hard, still buried in me, but he doesn't move. Go on, 
Pan says. Fucker. Pan, I didn't butter bash. Do it now. Not awkward, guys. Not awkward unless we let it be awkward. No, it is awkward though. He is no doubt holding his cigarette like this again. I can't see Pan, but I can feel his heavy gaze on my backside and somehow this is the most erotic thing I've ever experienced. I like it more than I should. I might have f***ed half the basketball team, but never at once. Bash picks up the tempo and I help him along, bouncing on him as we get closer and closer and the room fills with curling smoke and the smell of burning tobacco. F darling, just like that. F f yes. His chest rises and falls, and then all those muscles tense in his body as he growls and slams into me. Spelling cut inside me. Oh, ugh, mother. What is the likelihood that this is a test? Like, seriously. Potentially banged her mother and grandmother and who knows who else. And clearly don't wrap it before they tap it. I cannot take any more insults. I can't. Right before she reaches Nirvana, Pan yanks her off of Bash and she is, quote, throbbing, wet, and leaking. Ugh. Pan tells Bash to leave. He tosses Winnie into the chair and tells her, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. And she's like, oh, I think I do. And then just finger bangs herself in the chair. Right on. Pan watches her and eventually he pops some digits into her too. It's a party. After all, she says, quote, I'm being finger by a meth. Mm, that's it, right there. Oh yes, we don't fuck darlings, he tells me. Stop fucking around or you will regret it. And then he leaves me soaking wet and dirty in the chair. I feel dirty. We don't fuck the darlings. Well, I hate to tell you this. Just did. What a joke. Ugh. Chapter 11. Pan! He's so mad and hard. He's mad and hard. He lights another cigarette and smokes it aggressively on the balcony <laughs> overlooking the bonfire. Vane shows back up and he's back to normal now because apparently he took out all his rage and fury on Cherry. Pan even asked if Cherry survived. It's just cute. Cute and hot, you know? Cute, hot, rawr. <laughs> Vane can apparently smell the darling on Pan and gives Pan a warning about not letting her get into his head. The sun starts to rise and Pan goes back to his cave. Vampire rules, I guess. Chapter 12, Winnie. She wakes up and thinks to herself that if she hadn't been kidnapped, this would feel like a vacation. Cherry shows up and brings her food and coffee. Winnie notices that she's all sliced up and bruised from Vane. But Cherry evades her questions about it and just moves on. I pluck a berry from the bowl and pop it in my mouth. Cherry watches me. You're very pretty, she says. I know. She frowns at me. It's best to know what your assets are. Almost a parrot of Starla. This kid is so unlikable. Like, good for you for knowing that you're beautiful, you know, whatever. Why be a dick to a clearly battered woman who just brought you breakfast? But she makes it up by complimenting Cherry as well. Your hair and your freckles are an asset, I tell Cherry. Ah, another member of Team Freckles. Thank everything. And they start girl talk and when he asks which of the boys Cherry likes the best. Vane, of course. And then Cherry spills some beans. I lower my voice. I won't say anything, I promise. She checks the door and leans into me, excited to have a secret that I don't. There are more islands than Neverland. Seven islands, seven kings. Every island has two shadows, one for life, one for death. The king always claims a shadow. It's in his blood having the ability to claim it. Pan picked life a very long time ago, but when Pan lost his shadow, he lost the power. And now the island is suffering because of it. And I think Pan might be dying. She also tells Winnie that the boys, the twins, lost their wings because they killed her father to protect their sister, Tilly, and they were banished from the Fay Court. It's a whole thing. I care none. Terry says she's going to try and see if they can get Winnie to the bonfire tonight. She starts to leave, but our girl has more questions. Cherry, hmm? did Vane give you those cuts and bruises? She bites at her bottom lip before giving me a nervous laugh. <laughs> it comes with the territory. Which is what? Vane has a shadow, too, from another island. And his shadow is death. Ooh. Chapter 13, Bash. Twin hammock time on the beach. <laughs> Island boys. <laughs> Bash comes clean about getting dirty with the darling. Cass is like, cool, how was she? And Bash is like, slutty, just the way I like them. <clears throat> Cherry comes down to the beach to discuss the bonfire later. They discuss their disdain for her and even make fun of all of her wounds. Cass frowns at me and says, stop teasing her. Why when it's so easy to get her flustered? She asks them about Winnie coming to the bonfire. Cherry leaves and the boys continue to talk about their sister Tilly. And their dicks which can't be tamed, especially around the darling. They hypothesize that maybe Tilly is lying to Pan somehow, but who cares? Chapter 14, new POV, Brownie. Who the f is this? 
I have no idea. And the writing is atrocious because Brownie refers to themselves in the third person only. The Brownie has no name. Ariana, what are you doing here? He seems kind of like a little stooge person meant to serve the Fae Queen. Brownie tells the Queen, Tilly, that now is the time to take the island if she wants it because he can feel that Pan is getting weaker. And I guess Tinkerbell is Tilly's mother. I don't know and I doubt it matters. Chapter 15, Winnie again. I can't get enough of that girl and neither can any man she's ever met. Cass comes to talk to her, clearly bothered about something. My brother told me about last night. Ah, uh, yes. I'm sorry you did that. Don't be. He frowns at me. I like sex, Cass. I'm not afraid of it. He sits forward, claps his hands together. You were kidnapped and chained to a bed. Which made it that much more enjoyable. I smile sweetly at him. <sighs> What a kinky 18-year-old mess for these century-old beings to do the sex with. I love it. I definitely don't hate it. Then she says, Cass doesn't know that being chained to a bed is the least of what I've suffered. I pull my collar of my sweater up so he doesn't see my scars. Scars? On the neck? Are we getting vampires? No. No, we're not. We're not supposed to touch the darlings, he says, his voice taking on a harder edge. Bash knows that, and he broke the rule anyway because he's an arrogant, selfish prick. Oh, just my type. Cass's dark brow furrows. I laugh, and he finally catches the joke. It's not funny. All right, fine. I'm glad you're taking this so well. If only he'd watched me take it last night. Nah! <laughs> yeah, girl, if only. Nah! Ugh. They banter a bit more, and she tells us how beautiful these men are. They quote, make the basketball teams look like a bunch of ferrets. These mythical fey men? Shocking. I could, really? Are you sure? Cass offers her food. He's like, y'all sure do like feeding me. He's like, you look like you need feeding. It's all fun and games until they notice your fault lines, until they pry them open and peer inside. Didn't I tell you I'm secretly an assassin? Makes it easier to get into tight spaces. You don't have to do that. Do what? Pretend. This island has been pretending for far too long. He turns for the door. Come out when you're ready. And then he's gone. I sit with his words for a while. The problem is, I don't know how to stop pretending. See, again, it's really hard for me to have my yes queen moment for her. When she's constantly telling us how damaged of a person she is. She's frail. As Pan put it, not well. She needs feeding. She has sex with anyone who will sit still long enough. And she's apparently covered in scars that did not come from a vampire. I can't make it work. Make it work. I can't. Not to say that people who are struggling mentally can't girl boss their way to the top. I mean, look at me. She scoots off to the kitchen to get some food. And Bash is in there. What are you making? Honeysuckle tarts. What the fuck? They sound delicious. They will be. I slide onto one of the stools across the island from him. You think highly of yourself, don't you? If you're not the most interesting person you know, then you're doing it wrong. I arch a brow. Some would call that narcissism. She literally just had this exact conversation with Cherry. But now she wants to come out? I hate this kid. She tries to taste some of the food. And Bash stops her. Good girls wait their turn. And she says, quote, my belly dips and my clenches. Great. She sucks her finger and then Bash dips his into something edible. Looks like I need mine cleaned off too. Fuck. I've played this game before, but never with someone like Bash. Usually I'm the one baiting the hook, not the other way around. I don't know what to do with myself. I suddenly feel very naive and out of my depth. That's not very Starla of you. I thought this was where you shone the brightest. You've been telling us that this whole time. They're interrupted by Vane, thank God, who also dips his finger into something edible and smears it all over her face. <laughs> it's not funny. It, it's not. He wants to get a rise out of me. They all do in their own way. Taking in a deep breath, I run my tongue over my bottom lip and swipe away the mess. Mmm, so good. Frustration is a flicker in his good eye. I give him the same show I gave Bash and swipe up the last of the mess with my index finger and then stick it in my mouth and practically fuck myself with it. And then Vane's violet eye turns black. I don't know which visual I'm having a harder time with. Them smoking their cigarettes like this or her fucking her face with her finger. It might be a tie. So he's raging out and he grabs her and bends her over the thing. And she's scared, but not scared enough because she just arches her back and grinds into him. I haven't felt this way in a long time. Like I'm firmly in my body and enjoying every second of it. I've had so much sex, I can't even count the times. But I've never been in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing. You just said you felt like you were out of your depth. So which is it? This child is off the rails. He fucks around with her for a bit and then leaves her. Bummer! Bash comforts her, but she doesn't need comfort because she's so funny. So she makes a joke about how none of them wear shirts, that quirky little bitch. Cash and Cherry show up for food and drinky drinks. Fay wine, to be exact, which they warn her, like, to go easy on because it's very strong. And then they keep giving her more. 
it doesn't have to make sense if you don't want it to. Plus, our girl's been drunk before, so <laughs> whatever. Cherry refills us all, then come on, let's go down by the fire. Careful with our darling, Cass says. Cherry sighs, of course I will. Our darling? Am I theirs? Just the idea ignites some sort of strange flame in my gut. I've never been anyone's, not even my mother's. She might have birthed me and did the best she could putting a roof over our heads, but she was never capable of being a mother. The thought of belonging to someone is foreign and oddly gratifying. Stockholm Syndrome. There's no one here by that name. They go out to the beach and Cherry and Winnie keep talking and they're hanging out with a bunch of lost boys. Some boys come from Hook, some from town which keep that in your noggin. We'll get there. Bash and Cass are the only Fae that pan allowed, apparently. All the other Lost Boys are just like outcasts who didn't really belong anywhere and never wanted to grow up, so they came here. They also discuss the size of the island, which is super important. Pretty big. It would take you half a day to get to the other end by foot. So maybe like 10 miles across if I had to guess. I personally love it when a damaged, delusional, freshly 18-year-old misfit knows how to properly gauge and accurately estimate geodetic distance. Not only do I love it, but I believe it. Like, why wouldn't Winnie Whore have this skill set in her toolbox with her brains and her boobs? Mm. She starts to worry about going mad again like her mom. But maybe she can help without losing her mind. Can I help him find his shadow without subjecting myself to the brain melt? Yeah, she's unhinged before anybody touched her brain. Like, eh. Spoiler alert, the fake queen or whatever, the twin sister, Tilly, is going to come and root around in her brain to search for memories that she may or may not have about the whereabouts of Pan's shadow. I don't know. I take another sip of the wine and it immediately goes to my head and loosens the knot between my shoulders. Alcohol makes everything better. Healthy. Then she says that she's starting to like this place more than she probably should. There's something different about this girl, I tell ya. So cut to. Winnie and Cherry are playing a card game with some of the Lost Boys. Winnie is getting groped by one who smells like cigarettes and mischief. What? She giggles because she's hammered drunk and loves it. Oh my God, this is like her favorite thing. Her name is Winnie Horror. She's in her element. The boy edges closer and I glow beneath his attention. This is always where I'm most in my body, when someone else is touching it, when my nerves are awake. It's hard sometimes to feel anything at all. Cherry laughs and falls off her chair and the boy beside her helps her back up. My red haired wonder pulls me into his lap and his cock presses hard at my center. He's no bash or cast, and he's certainly no pan, but he'll do just fine. I lean in and kiss him. Healthy, again. Red-haired wonder is something else, too. She, they just met, and she doesn't even know his name, but she calls him her red-headed wonder. Whatever, he'll do. Do for what? How does doing this guy play into her fuck her way to freedom plan. I'm thinking too much, again, and that's my apologies because I've already learned that there's no room for that in books like this, so forgive me. Chapter 16, Peter Pan. Uh-oh. Vane wakes Pan up and tattles on everybody. Pan's pissed to learn that Winnie is living up to her nickname with some random lost boy, so he tears out of the cave with violence in his heart. <laughs> Why do I care? The rule about not touching darlings only pertains to myself, cast. Bash and Benny, because we're the only ones that matter. I don't give a fuck what the other Lost Boys do, so the question stands. Why do I care? I don't know. I don't know why. Fuck the darling has nothing to do with getting inside her head. It's the inherited memories I need, not that pretty little darling. Vane tries to talk him down, but it doesn't work because off they go to the party. All right, violence it is. He follows me up the stairs. I take them two at a time. And the whole way up, his voice is a singing lilt behind me. Brace yourself. <clears throat> three, two, one. One, two, three. Better watch out. Peter Pan is going to murder thee. This right here is why I stopped writing poetry. I know I'm never gonna get to this level. So why bother? Like seriously, why bother at all? If any of you out there watching this right now are aspiring writers, poets, scribes of some kind, I need you to just give up. Like you just heard that, right? Three, two, one. One, two, three. Better watch out. Peter Pan is going to murder thee. You're never gonna get there. Never. He yoinks the darling and tosses her into Vane's arms. And then he, no shit, rips this boy's heart out of his chest. Not the redheaded wonder. When I turn back to the darling, a heart in my hand, her eyes are full of tears. Good. She needs to know there are no white knights here, just monsters. And I'm the worst one. Chapter 17, Winnie. Pan takes her back to the house, flanked by the other three. 
tell her they have rules and asks, are you just fucking everyone to provoke me? Yes, I hear myself saying. They call me Winnie whore, you know. F boys is what I do best. <laughs> um, hearing this, he decides to just bang her right there with the three others watching. If you want to act like a whore, I'll treat you like one. Yikes. Slams her down and shit. And I'm sure someone would find this hot. No one here, though. <laughs> Winnie's having a blast, though. The personification of Niagara falls in this moment. Also, like, Peter Pan kidnapped this kid, right? Held her in a strange place. Has no doubt banged it out with some of her other relatives through time. It is still... 100% guaranteed covered in the redheaded wonder's blood. But yeah, she's loving it. Whoosh. <laughs> then the twins get a turn with her while everybody else watches. How sweet that they share. No judgment here for a group scene. Do it up. Have fun. However, brothers. Same girl. Same girl thing to home. Mm, just a little too sweet home Alabama for me. Any hoosers, they bang her. One on each end, if you get me. And they call her by her nickname. Pan watches this whole thing, and Winnie has never felt more alive. I feel like my whole body's covered in fire ants, but no one asked. They simultaneously erupt the way only twins can, I guess. Vane's turn. I part my lips. Vane gets in close and spits in my mouth. That's all you'll get from me. I cackled at this, but I'm not falling for it. The only reason that there's ever a character like this, who is shown resisting the womanly wiles of the female main character, is so that he can later be written in as the most protective, most loving, most whipped of all the men. God, this is boring. If I weren't so caffeinated, I would have already fallen asleep. Don't ever provoke me again. There's still blood on his hand and it finally registers that he killed someone then fucked me. What is happening? And why the hell do I feel so fucking amazing right now? Is this part of the madness driving me to new heights of pleasure and debauchery? But no, they don't fuck darlings. Just did, just did, just did, okay. All these questions deserve unpacking, but I'm not making that therapist money. I'm just gonna leave them alone. But I don't believe for a second that they have not slept with the darlings in the past. I hate this book, but Winnie's never felt more alive, saying, quote, I'm no longer lost. I think I might have finally been found. Because you had group sex and someone spit in your mouth? <laughs> I mean, I get it. Chapter 18, Cass, this is a really short one. It's pointless, but aren't they all? Twins take her back to the room. She has a shower, and while she's doing that, the twins talk about how much more they want to do to her. Incredible. Chapter 19, Pan. Pan and Vane go on an adventure? Count me in. Remember that we mentioned the town a few chapters ago, right? Okay, great. We're gonna play a little game. First of all, if you have a thinking cap on, take it off, you don't need it. And then I want you to take your brain and I want you to use it, but only at like 20% of its full power. Dial it way down. Just search your brain and tell me what you think this town is named, okay? I'll wait. <laughs> Where are we going, Vane asks. Let's go kill some pirates. Twist my arm. We follow the road from the house as it winds through the forest, then crosses Mysterious River, then finally spills into Darlington Port. Darlington is my city, founded on my blood and magic. Yeah, Darlington. <sighs> no. Again, aspiring writers of the world, just give it up. Anyway, they roll into town and off two pirates for literally no reason at all. What a night. Chapter 20, Winnie. <laughs> I've never slept in a bed with someone else, but as I climb in beneath the sheets with Cass on my left and Bash on my right, I feel oddly content. It's like sleeping between two ridiculously hot sentinels. If you're dumb like me and didn't know what a sentinel was, I googled it. It's basically a guard meant to keep watch, and if you'll remember, I think it was chapter two. As soon as Winnie got there, Pan said, watch her. So with that in mind, and the fact that we keep hearing about how hot both of them are, yes, Winnie, that is exactly what it's like. She's real dumb, but they don't call her Winnie the Brain. Now we know why. Then they do this, and I don't know why, but it sent me, it sent me over the edge. What's that? I ask and nod at whatever he has in his hands. He winds his arm around me and holds up my arm, tying a rope bracelet around my wrist. There's an acorn cap threaded through the rope. A kiss, he says. What? He laughs through his nose. The acorn cap is a kiss. It's a thing here. Just pretend it is. Okay, I will not. I will not stand for this. This imagery belongs only here. So scrub this from your memory as far as this book is concerned. Just throw it out. I can't allow it. They lay there, chit chat, I'll spare you. Then one of the twins accidentally touches a sensitive part of Winnie's back. I guess no one accidentally touched it while she was getting railed in the kitchen. But okay, sure, 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 okay, sure. 
Over the years, I've gotten used to the constant ache in my body, the pounding headaches, the sharp, sudden bursts of pains in my nerves. When you're carved up by witches and so-called voodoo priests, pain becomes second nature. I would take the pain over losing my mind any day, so I never complained. I did what my mother told me to do with the slimmest hope that I wouldn't turn out like her. Okay, so now we know where the scars came from. Her mom was subjecting her to barbaric torture methods in hopes of protecting her from this fate. And that does sound upsetting and excruciating for sure. And like a betrayal because her mother did all of this to her, which just goes to further show how neglected, how unwell this child must be. But the pacing of all of this, like it's just thrown in here and glued together with an Elmer's glue stick. And you know those bitches ain't sticking. Before she falls asleep, sandwiched between two hot fey guys, they ask her what her favorite food is. And she says, croissants. Crescents. Croissants. Chapter 21, Winnie again. She wakes the next morning alone, but sees a sweatshirt on the wingback chair, so she pulls it on, and oh my god, it swallows her. She is itty bitty. She wanders into the kitchen to see that Bash has made her croissants. Ah! And this could have been a sweet moment, but it wasn't. And then he got up early to make it for me. Thank you, I say. Don't mention it, darling. After the way your treated me last night, it's the least I can do. Ah! They discuss where everyone is. It's boring. Pan's in his cave because sunlight kills him, remember? Still no clue why. Cass comes in with a stringer of fish, and if you think that that is not important enough to note, please know that the stringer of fish is a main character for the next two chapters. Winnie is appalled by this rope full of dead fish, which I think is really funny because she just got railed by a man covered in redheaded wonder blood. But dying fish? There is a line, fellas. They see her reaction to this and they're like, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna teach you how to clean fish. Why? I don't know. Please stop asking me that. And they go on for multiple pages and two chapters detailing the teaching of the cleaning of the fish. And she talks about how she doesn't need to be taken care of. I don't need to be taken care of. I reposition the fish to get around one of the fins. More scales fly through the air. I disagree. Cass's voice is light, but his gaze is dark. My face pinks again. I've literally taken care of myself my entire life, on my own. When my mom wasn't out escorting old white men, she was home, descending further and further into madness. The only person I could count on was me. So her mom is a worker. But then why did Starla exist? Why? Why? God damn it to hell. All of it. The boys are like, oh, old white men, huh? We got a lot of those buried under the house. And then keep showing her how to clean and scale fish. Are you watching? Dad, look how fast I can run. Yes. Insert the blade here. He points the tip just below the fish's mouth. Then run it back to the anal fin. I blanch at the mention of anal. Why is everything the boys do sexual? First of all, everything has an anus, okay? Uh, dogs, chickens, birds. Chickens are birds. I'm upset! I mean, jellyfish don't. I don't think, think they excrete the same way they intake. Snakes don't technically have an anus. They have like a, I don't know what, why are we talking about this? Next, they're cutting up a fish. This is the least sexy thing that anyone's ever done. And I know that because I know how to do this. But aside from that, that's literally what the fin is called. There are multiple fins on a fish. That fin is named such because of the proximity to its anus. Where is the line? Is it just hot men mentioning anal? Is like, is that what activates you? Is it the butthole in general? If the boys take a shit, is that sexual too? Mm. Anyway, let's try to move on from this because I literally hate it. Also, the boys finally tell her that they're fey princes. Wonderful, no one cares. Chapter 22, Cass. We're still gutting fish if you were curious. Don't you worry. They tell her some more about the Fae and how they were banished and lost their wings. No one cares. I made no notes. Chapter 23, Winnie. Winnie is bushwhacked, okay? She is buzzing with questions about the Fae and the sister and the banishment, all these things. But she stumbles in on vain reading Frankenstein in the library. So all those thoughts are gonna have to wait. Last night when he spit in my mouth, I wanted to tear him apart. Out of all the idiots I slept with, no one had ever treated me like a slut, even though I sort of was. I'm not ashamed of my life choices. For the last decade, I was expecting my life to end on my 18th birthday. Maybe not literally, but figuratively. A slow descent into madness. So I took what I wanted, how I wanted it, because none of it felt like it mattered anyway. Even though on my 18th birthday has come and gone, now that I'm in Neverland and a myth of Peter Pan has proven itself to be real, I still can't shake the feeling that I'm running on borrowed time. And if I am, I want to continue to take. I want to do whatever the fuck I want, even if it kills me. So she taunts him and goes over and straddles him, which I think is a great idea. 
Now that you're here, he says, what do you plan to do about it? He's tempting me, teasing me. He shifts again, this time pressing forward with his hips. He's not hard yet though, and it pisses me off. All of those needy, inexperienced football players were hard on a dime. Wendy, real quick, sorry to interrupt, okay? Please tell me exactly how many sports teams you fucked. Every single detail, leave nothing out. I'm not wearing a bra. So my breasts hit the air and my nipples immediately shrink to dark beads. Vane growls again, and now, now he's hard. I'm full of so much pride I might float off into a rain cloud. Men sleep with dead people. Just as long as he doesn't see my back. Just as long as he doesn't see my scars. I don't want him to think me weak. I don't want him to think me weak. Did I stumble into a book in the Old Testament? What the fuck is this? He gazeth upon her scars and saweth that she be weak. Rage. I just only rage. They go back and forth a bit. It's done. Blah, blah. Before I know what's happening, he has me pinned on the floor. His entire body vibrating with barely restrained rage. Same. Same. Listen to me very carefully, darling. His teeth grinding together. You do not want to fuck with me. I choke down air, trying to keep the terror at bay as my heart pounds a warning in my ears. I just want to be fucked by you. He sits up and slaps my tit. So he slaps her tit and leaves. Ugh. Chapter 24. Pan. Pan wanders in and finds her alone reading Frankenstein. She smiles at me, pretty little darling girl. I want to drive her to the floor and shove my dick in her mouth, watch her gag on it. I'm not a nice man. I'm a worse king. I can pretend though, for now. She shuts the book and looks down at it as if she's only realizing now that she had it. Frankenstein. Classic. I guess. She's reading a book about monsters in a den of monsters. How f poetic. That is poetic, Peter. It really is. Especially the way you meticulously spelled it out for us like that. Pure poetry. Pan tells us to prepare for the night because this is the night that the Fae Queen is coming. He does tell her a little bit more about it. How one of her ancestors stole the shadow. How memories are sometimes transferred down generational lines, even if you're not aware of it. Blah, blah, blah. He also shares with us that he's not particularly excited about watching this darling be subjected to this kind of torture. I don't want this darling to change. Usually when I take them, they rave and scream or they sob and quiver. This one's like a feral cat that wants to push a saucer of milk off the table just to watch it spill. I like that about her. Brave little darling girl, wild and reckless, always up for depraved adventure. I know, okay? I know that we're supposed to think that this girl is special, but we're on chapter 24. Even if she is different from all the darlings before her, I've yet to see evidence explaining this, aside from the fact that she's horned up all the time. Is that it? Is it just because she's horny as I'll get out? Because again, that's not rare. This is a hormonal teenager who is neglected and dealing with her past traumas through promiscuity, you know? Plus, let's not forget the beautiful line, we're the lost boys and there's lots of lost pussy to be found. So they're having sex. Like, what the fuck is this? And they go for a walk. He asks about her scars, so much for hiding them. I hope he doesn't think she weak. <coughs> he tells her that there was a coup when her ancestor stole the shadow. He takes her to the lagoon where there are ghostly looking mermaids swimming about. This is amazing, the darling says. Your mother said the same thing. She frowns. You brought my mom here? She was not well, I admit. Sometimes the lagoon can be healing. I thought maybe it would help her. The girl is looking at me now like she doesn't recognize me. You tried to help her? She softens and takes a step towards me. I turn away. She was sobbing all night long, I say. I had to shut her up somehow. Can't be nice for more than two seconds. He mentioned something vague about Mary and how that wasn't the whole truth about her crying or why she was crying. And he says, quote, when she told me why she was crying and it cuts off and it tells us nothing. Tell me or don't. He takes her back home to put on dry clothes before the Fae Queen shows up and melts her mind. So kind. Chapter 25, Winnie. They're back and Vane's like, where have you been? And Winnie is so dang myth that she can't crack his walls when this is like her superpower. Bash comes into the room. Listen, darling, you may be at risk of being knocked over by a stiff breeze, but here, you're stronger than you think. And you're gonna let our dear sister get in your head and you're gonna help us find Peter Pan's shadow, okay? I believe that. I believe you're different from every single darling that's come before you. I swallow against the lump growing in my throat. You think so? Yeah, he grins at me. We got to fuck you. Her mind is strong because they gang banged her. Totally. Totally, I have no follow-up questions. I wanna help Pan. I wanna be the one that gets him his shadow, but I don't wanna lose my head doing it. I've endured, I've endured the sickness of so-called magic potions that only made me vomit for days. I've endured blades cutting into my flesh, the blood collected to paint across my ceiling. I have endured and I can endure this. I can finally end the curse for all of us. Okay, I nod and pull Peter Pan's shirt off. I can do this. 
They go wherever to meet Tilly. The twins are nervous and so is Winnie the whore. Oh bother. They exchange formalities and then Winnie is penetrated. Not like that. Her mind. I'm sorry. I forgot what we were up to. It's her mind this time. Chapter 26. Bash. Tilly starts. The boys are not happy. I don't want her to turn out like the rest, dazed and far away. Like her mother, we made Mary a promise and we broke it. There's a single moment when I consider stopping Tilly. Damn the consequences. I nearly do it too, but someone else beats me to it. Not my brother. Not Pan. But Vane. Ah! It's the death shadow that leaps in. The most closed off, the most difficult to crack, becomes the most protective, the most loving, the most whipped of all of them. I feel like someone said that before. Let me just... All right, it was me. Chapter 27, Winnie, bless. Winnie's not having a good time with this. It is excruciating. And this is definitely not the kind of penetration she enjoys, but she's gonna do it because the boys need her. No more, he says. His voice is a distant rumble over top of me. I have the distinct sensation of being lifted in the air and cradled against a solid chest. Vain. Pan's voice rings with authority. No, we're not doing this anymore. Vane starts away. I wasn't done, Tilly calls. I'm saying you're done. He keeps walking, his footsteps heavy on the hardwood floor. So Vane takes her back to the room and she says, I'm stronger than you think I am. And he says, even the mighty oak believes she's strong until a man comes along with an ax to chop her down. Is that you then? Do you have an ax? All men are born with an ax in their hands, darling. To take the measure of a man, you just have to pay attention to how he wields it. Not the mighty oak. Poetry. Poetry. Putting the tree. In poetry! Aha! Boop! Mm. Chapter 28, Winnie. Winnie has a dream, I guess. She's watching her great-grandmother, Wendy, the original darling, pop out a secret compartment in a chest that's back at Winnie's house. She hides the shadow in there. Tink is there as well, and she kills Wendy. Winnie wakes up, storms off to the tomb to find Pan. All the boys following her. They get to the bottom of things, I guess. It might have been a darling who took my shadow, but it was Tink who masterminded the entire thing with the help of one of the lost boys. With Toodles. Toodles. What an odd name. Why would Tink do that? Because Tinkerbell was in love with Peter, Vane answers. That makes no sense. If she loved you. She may have loved me, he says, but she hated darlings more. So? So I just happened to love one. I was in love with the original darling. Mm. So Pan, who just slept with Winnie, was in love with her great, great grandmother. <sighs> That's beautiful. I'm so glad they finally that's great. I'm also really glad that she had this premonition right after Vane decided to save her at the last minute. Oddly convenient. So Wendy is her great grandmother. There's an unknown grandmother. Mary is her mother. And Winnie, poor, is the current darling, right? They also mentioned that Wendy had a little sister that they went after as well. And if Wendy got killed, I, I'm just, how could she be a great grandma? She would be the great aunt if they went to the sister. And then the sister kept having children, right? I just, this family tree... But it doesn't have to make sense. Remember, it just really doesn't. Chapter 29, Pan. They decide to go back to the real world and check this trunk. No one thought of that before now, I guess. Four generations. Four generations and no one thought to like check for hollow spots in the trunk. Kidnapping, torture, nonsense. No one thought to check the trunk for secret compartments. Okay. The darling is set between the twins and looks like a tiny doll against their tallness. I know. I know. She's little buddy. Everything about her appears fragile and breakable, but she's anything but. She reminds me a lot of her mother. So how do you get there? Best way is to fly, I answer. Can you fly? Not anymore. And we lost our wings, Cass says. Vane? She asks. I could fly, but I'm not hauling all your asses. We'll take another route. And what's that? We leap off Marooner's Rock. You must be joking. Please tell me you're joking. We never joke about jumping off cliffs. I don't want to jump off a cliff. Too bad. Small and teeny and doesn't want to jump. Oh my word. So they're off to her home again. Whoopee. She'll go home. She gets the shadow. She never has to come back to Netherland again. Woo. But shocking, that might not be what she wants. They jump and hope for the best. Chapter 30. Winnie. They make it there safely and head to her house. But someone beat them there. Oh, <gasps> Brownie. And a bunch of little brownie dudes. I know, you're probably like, what? I forgot about this. Yeah, you know that weird little fucker that talked in the third person from like chapter five or something? Yeah, me neither. Anyway, he's loyal to Tink and he's there on her behalf, even though she's dead too, sure. Brownie also reveals that he always knew exactly where the shadow was. Groovy. Why didn't you just destroy it then or claim it? Whatever it is that you're hoping to do here, why not just do it before now? 
So Tilly wants to overthrow Pan because he was a vicious king and surely no one wants that king back. I watched Pan's face for a reaction. I know he can be vicious. I watched him kill that lost boy for nothing more than flirting with me. But just how vicious is he? That, that vicious Winnie. Winnie is a single cell organism. Winnie the moron. A sword fight breaks out. <laughs> Winnie goes to her mom and they start banging, not men, no, the walls inside the trunk to find the secret compartment. They find it and there's a box inside. Chapter 31, Pan. All the lesser brownies have been dealt with and there's just the main brownie left. I wish I had a brownie. Brownie tries to persuade the twins to betray Pan. You can claim the shadow and reclaim your place on the throne and the kingdom will be yours, blah, blah, blah. And it's revealed that the whole time, all these darlings that returned to the world broken was because Tilly wasn't actually trying to help. She's trying to overthrow. So she broke them on purpose so that the memory would never come to light. But again, they knew where the shadow was. Even if they didn't want to claim it, why didn't they just go get it and move it. Ugh. They kill Brownie and Pan is faced with the box containing his shadow for the first time. She comes closer. The box is etched with fey runes. I can still smell tink on it like autumn leaves and fairy dust. She was my best friend once until she wasn't and I'm gutted all over again remembering how it ended. When I found out what she'd done, that she'd masterminded stealing my shadow as some form of revenge, I'd gone to her and I'd said, I don't believe in fairies. Her light winked out. Her eyes went white and within seconds she was dead just like that. I didn't even have to get my hands dirty. <sighs> Mary takes the three boys outside to find shovels so they can bury all these brownies in the backyard. Which doesn't make any sense because a few sentences from here they say that the brownies will turn to dust in a few days anyway. So just pile them up in the woodshed where the shovels were and wait for them to turn to dust. I, Pan and Darling stand together on their own and Darling's like, take me back with you. She wants to stay with them and help them rebuild. And she also has a feeling that Tilly might be up to something else because she's just really good at reading people. We've always been a house of cold, hard edges. Say that again. Say it more. Would it be so bad to have someone with soft curves, someone to share, fuck her and make her quiver, make her beg for Lost Boy come? Oh my God. So sweet. Fine, I tell her. You can come back with me. She smiles triumphantly up at me. Don't get cocky. I won't. I'll just get cock. <laughs> Chapter 32. Winnie. <sighs> Apparently Mary's like chill now. And when Winnie's like, do you want to come back with me? And she's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> Years of mental illness and anguish, paranoia and misery. But now she's cool. Sure. Will she be okay without me? She loved me fiercely, but her love always hurt. I don't know how it feels to be loved the right way or to choose to feel the hurt instead of being forced into it. She still doesn't know how to be loved without being forced into it because she was literally kidnapped, but whatever. Epilogue. Oh, thank God. Pan. They arrive back in the loft in Neverland. Pan is presented with his shadow. Vane pours everyone shots. Pan opens the lid and <gasps> two shadows pop out. The end. I love a cliffhanger ending, don't you? Listen, I'm not done. I'm going to give you my final thoughts, but I want you to know that I do have a copy of the second book already. I haven't touched it, glanced at it, even considered it because I'm still recovering from this. However, if you had fun during this, let me know and I will consider. Here are my final thoughts. I will always have a special connection to the story of Peter Pan, whether it's the Disney cartoon classic, Hook with Robin Williams, or even the updated version in the series Once Upon a Time. I love that story so much and I will always gravitate towards it, even if what I get is a pile of wet newspaper in my hand, which is what this is. As I said at the beginning of this video, I've read another reimagining, Hooked by Emily McIntyre, and I really had fun with it. It wasn't amazing or anything, but it was fun. I enjoyed the little Easter eggs and the nods to things that you would know if you liked Peter Pan. So it can be achieved. It can be an enjoyable experience. This, however, the premise felt promising. I was very intrigued by the whole concept of this book. However, in execution, it felt half formed and fully dreadful. None of the characters were distinct enough to form a connection with, distinguishable or even likable aspects of the story and the plot were not fully fleshed out. So they ended up feeling one dimensional or cheap with nonsensical and predictable resolutions solutions to a lackluster story. Winnie Whore was so dislikable as a main character. A teenager only known for sleeping her way through entire high schools just didn't do it for me. I don't know what went wrong. And despite the author's desperate attempts to make her a likable person that we wanted to root for and to convince us that she was somehow special, there was nothing else to her. The writing was choppy and immature, fragment city. The dialogue was angsty and try hard. And that's something that I encounter a lot with books like this. The very, you're not that real dad energy of all these characters, but it won't ever appeal to me. So I don't know why I keep doing this to myself. All in all, I had a bad time. I had a great time reviewing it though, but a bad time reading it. I think The Never King deserves like 1.5 
to two stars. The premise was promising. There were a couple of aspects of the story that I really liked. And I think that had the author spent a little more time on those things instead of randomly writing in a stereotypical sex worker for no reason, I think it could have been a little bit better than it was. Again, I would be willing to consider continuing with this series if this is a video that you enjoyed. Please let me know. And just so you know, I respond very well to external motivation in the form of cash. So if you want to hop on over to my Patreon and financially peer pressure me into doing another review of this series, I'll consider it. I will. Don't think me weak. I guess this is where I'm meant to plug everything. I know you're going to skip it anyway. Plus, I've had just the shittiest week, so this is going to be like kind of blech. But I have new items in the store if you're interested. Some of them are very spooky season inspired, so that's kind of fun if you want to check that out. Again, I have a Patreon. I also have a coffee. All the links can be found below or on my page. You can also join directly here and get early access to all my videos that I post on here for like a little monthly donation. I don't know how it works. I'm just getting used to all of this. And like I said, I've had one of the worst months of my entire life. I'm not going to cry. Thank you for being here. Let me know what I should read next. I have two reviews in my noggin that I think I'm going to really like try to work on. If you want to follow me, all my socials are down below. Everything you could think of or need or want can be found below. Stay weird. <laughs>